Hi, this is Nate Short, managing broker of Windermere Redmond, and also the founder of Run Your Business Like a Business, otherwise known as RibLab, which is a new coaching company focused on helping real estate agents become more profitable, more efficient, and effective in their real estate businesses, and really running their businesses like a business. And you're on our Facebook page, and this is actually our first Facebook Live event, which I'm really happy to have. It's only been a technology that's been about here for the last couple months. And I'm joined with a very special guest, uh, our Windermere Chief Economist, Matthew Gardner. And Matthew, um, welcome to Redmond. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, thank you. Thanks for coming. Happy to be here. Uh, I thought what we would do uh, is just have a very casual conversation about what's happening in 2017 or what you're uh, seeing economically and how it's going to affect the real estate market. And, and more so, just I wanted to start macro, big picture. You know, what's going on nationally with real estate? The real estate nationally is kind of an interesting position right now. Um, obviously, we're between two presidencies. There's a certain amount of uncertainty that is driven by that. Uh, however, as far as the U.S. housing market is concerned, still remarkably robust. I think certainly we've seen mortgage rates move up fairly modestly. Um, they say if a quarter point jump isn't really modest, uh, but it certainly could have been a lot more. We still got certainly more demand than supply. I think anywhere in the country you go, there's more buyers than there are sellers. And so do I expect that to continue through next year? I think it will. Um, but housing is remarkably robust today and likely to stay that way for quite some time. Obviously, what I think what is on a lot of people's minds is what is the Trump presidency? What's that effect? Now, we've had a, a month and a half or so to digest that, um, that, you know, his presidency. Any thoughts on that as far as what the effect it will have on real estate? I think it's fascinating the effects you've seen before the gentleman actually becomes president. Uh, it's still another, what, 40 days, I think, or so, until he actually takes office. Yeah. So, um, but what effects have we seen already? Well, certainly we've seen an increase in mortgage rates. They've jumped up by about a third of a point, mm -hmm. right, between 35, 40 basis points. Why has that happened? Well, it's happened because there's an expectation we'll see some inflation. And bond markets really do not like inflation. They, the bond markets drive mortgage rates. Therefore, we saw a, a jump, and a remarkably quick jump as well. I haven't seen that level of increase so quickly since probably 2013. So we've seen an increase in interest rates, but they are still from historic levels remarkably cheap. I think also the potential going forward uh, is twofold, one of which is uh, the construction industry. Uh, we're quite likely to see builders potentially building more. Yes, we are. Why is this? Well, certainly uh, Trump has said he's looking to implement some more deregulation, uh, i.e. Uh, make it actually easier for builders to build. Mm. And if that happens, that has positive implications to supply and also actually it could decrease pricing if you take away some of these regulations. Mm. So you could actually see more starts, uh, more new home sales next year. Mm. That is certainly needed. Absolutely. So you look at mortgage rates, which we've got a little bit, we'll see uh, starts. The construction industry, I think, is going to do pretty well. Those are two major components uh, when we talk about uh, what potential impacts uh, that the Trump presidency can have. There is actually one more. And that is the fact of deregulation in the financial markets. Mm -hmm. It's quite possible, or at least that is one of his goals, is to allow banks to lend to people, not necessarily with bad credit quality, mm -hmm. but shall we say not stellar credit quality, which is where we are today. Mm -hmm. So we can actually see an increasing level of demand mm -hmm. uh, for housing next year as well. Mm -hmm. But that could be a ways off. We're still uncertain whether that will actually be the case or not. Mm -hmm. So as far as housing goes, uh, there are negatives uh, as it relates to real estate because of the upcoming uh, or incoming president. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still going to uh, hold judgment in a lot of respects, but the potential is uh, it could actually allow the housing market certainly to continue to expand through the course of the next couple of years. That's great. I'm here with Matthew Gardner, Chief Economist of Windermere Real Estate, and I know that there's still several people joining the feed, so I just wanted to welcome them. Um, and, and if you like this page, please you know, like it and share it with your friends. Um, it's a real honor to have you here, and we're just talking about uh, Trump's uh, effect potentially on, on the real estate market. And let's uh, continue to go on here. What about Ben Carson getting um, the, the head nominee? Um, uh, Dr. Carson, a surprise. Uh, certainly somebody that uh, clearly is a brain, is a brain, uh, a brain surgeon. Yeah. Um, obviously very good at what he does, doesn't necessarily translate across the ability to run uh, 
Housing and Urban Development, which understand the fact that it's a group with a $50 billion budget um, and employs about 8,000 people. It's not what he does. Um, now, you can say, well, he came from that background, therefore has uh, there's benefit to that. There could be. Uh, however, I'm actually, again, going to hold judgment. It wasn't a, a surprise from my perspective. I believe there were many people out there potentially more qualified mm -hmm. um, to undertake that position. But again, knowing the fact that uh, the incoming president-elect uh, does want to shake things up, um, it certainly this this uh, this choice is a, is a big shake-up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you, um, nationally, you know, if you were to put money somewhere as an investor, uh, and, and not just leaving Washington State out of it, where would be some good places to invest in 2017, do you think? We're talking about housing or, or just the economy? Yeah, just, how, just housing. Housing. Yeah. Um, I, I think Oregon's got some more legs to it. Um, Colorado, absolutely. I think we're actually going to see some quite uh, rapid or rapid uh, price appreciation actually in, in Las Vegas, in Nevada. Mm -hmm. However, prices are still remarkably low there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think really you'd have to look, I would look certainly at the West Coast mm -hmm. as being an area which I would focus upon. Mm -hmm. uh, Utah, doing very, very well, uh, as, it, as it's Colorado. So Idaho, uh, Coeur d'Alene probably, Boise certainly. Mm -hmm. But I think all the markets that I look at uh, are really going to be within the 10 western states, mm -hmm. um, less so in the Midwest, and I'll probably still stay away from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, I know I've read some articles on kind of bringing it more locally to Washington State, which I know most of our viewers are really interested in, is that, um, you know, I, some, of the, some of the publications out there named us the fourth, you know, hottest market in the, as far as appreciation goes in the country. What do you see happening for this our local you know real estate market here in Washington State and, and even more so in the Puget Sound area. I will say are we a very hot market? Yes, we are. There's several reasons why that is the case. Anytime, anytime anyone talks about you've got a thriving housing market, what drives that? Mm -hmm. What drives that is the local economy and specifically job creation. Right now in the Puget Sound region, certainly in the Seattle metropolitan area, mm -hmm. the second fastest growing uh, in terms of job growth market in the country behind Orlando, Florida. So we look at it, in, in, and actually Dallas is, uh, is up there as well, but yeah. we're certainly well up there in, in terms of our employment growth and potential growth going forward. So we're creating a lot of jobs, that creates demand for housing, that's certainly a positive. Mm -hmm. But what's also what kind of offsets that is the mm -hmm. fact that we need to build more housing, but we can't. We are topographically constrained here in the Puget Sound. A lot of water, a lot of mountains, not a particularly attractive transit infrastructure, and that actually puts upward pressure on pricing as well, because there's a value to our time. We want to live uh, close to where we work, essentially, and we'll pay more where we can to do that. So housing prices tend to start out at the, at the core markets, uh, the, the Bellevues and, and the Seattles, and prices decrease the further you move away from those urban centers. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot more demand than we have supply. We have got a very limited supply of land, mm -hmm. and that's made land remarkably expensive. Yeah. So when you limit supply and you think you have net new demand, prices tend to escalate at above normalized rates. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were in another market, let's say in Texas or in Houston, for example, um, there are no barriers to growth. You tend not to see huge home price appreciation mm -hmm. in those markets, but you can keep on building. The same thing applies to Phoenix as well. So here we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and because of our thriving economy, uh, last time more people moved out of our region than moved in, 1973. Hmm. It's been after the Boeing bust of 72, so remarkably long time of more, more coming in than going out. Mm -hmm. I would say in the three county area, we're going to see demand for about 38,000 new owner-occupied housing units in the next five years. Right. Uh, we'll, we're not going to meet that demand. That again is going to put upper pressure certainly on the resale markets. So we're still not building as much as we need to? <laughs> not even by, close. By, by far. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly okay. locally and actually and nationally as well. I said a year ago that I thought New Home Starts uh, would be mm -hmm. one of the big stories in mm -hmm. 2016. Mm -hmm. That was proved to be the case. It starts up by about 12%, so that certainly is good. But we are still well below where we need to be just to meet population growth. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at certain sub-markets, let's say states of Washington or even the Puget Sound, we're not even building close to the level that we need to be. And we're running out of land. Mm. And that's going to become a problem. Tell us a, a little bit about the growth boundary area. You talked about that mm. in several areas. Because I know uh, we just got some of the Windermere statistics this morning on 
months supply. We only have one month supply here on the east side, and we have 0.7 months supply in Seattle. You're telling us, hey, we don't even have enough land. We're not building enough to meet that demand. And I think last year you said about 86,000 people moved to the area. Yeah. Is it the same this year? And Actually, it's more this year. Mm -hmm. uh, in the three county area, we've seen a big amount of in migration. So we've had in the three county market probably over, say over 60,000 people have moved here from somewhere else. That is in addition mm -hmm. to the, the natural growth. The natural growth is basically births minus deaths. Mm -hmm. And so we add on another 20 or 30,000 every year, just uh, more people being born mm -hmm. than anything else. So, so it's remarkably rapid. Um, and again, the bigger picture, Time-wise, uh, if the Puget Sound Regional Council say they expect between now and 2040, another 900,000 people to be wow. living in the four-county area. Where are they all going to live? Yeah. And that, I think, is, is a remarkably big problem. And it's an ongoing problem as well. Mm -hmm. As we talk about limited supply pushing prices up, the most important thing for me is the fact that we remain competitive economically. Mm -hmm. What's important when companies open up in the market is how much they have to pay their staff. And the biggest component of what people make is their cost of living. Yeah. And so if all of a sudden we become uncompetitive, then it's quite possible these firms that were thinking about opening or expanding in Seattle say, well, I can do that in Idaho, I can do it in Coeur d'Alene or Boise, mm -hmm. a lot cheaper mm -hmm. than I could in Seattle. So it's going to be imperative upon us uh, as a market, and certainly as far as politically speaking is concerned, yeah. uh, that we try and understand what the needs are and meet those needs so we remain competitive from an economic standpoint. Mm. So as far as affordability goes, I know that's been a huge component for you know, a huge worry for yes. you and other people yes. and I think for as real estate agents, you know, we see the prices continuing to go up at double digit paces and we know that that can't continue. Um, you know, what is uh, what does affordability look like now? I mean, as far as historically right. in the trend lines and things like that and is it still a good time to buy? Right. Well, I'd say absolutely it is. But it depends on why you are choosing to buy. If you're choosing to buy purely as an in investment, so I buy a house and I don't have to save up uh, in my retirement savings, then don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, if the expectation is I need somewhere to live, mm -hmm. I'm going to stay there for a fairly prolonged period of time, mm -hmm. uh, then is it going to be a valuable asset for you as a home first, an investment later, mm -hmm. absolutely that's going to be the case. Affordability is interesting. Right now, in, in, if you look at the real numbers then, uh, county-wide, King, Kips, Pierce, Nomish, yes, you can say we are, quote, affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, county-wide is probably true. Mm -hmm. That's for all buyers. However, if you look at first-time buyers, none of the three county markets are affordable. It's remarkably hard for the first-time buyer to get into our housing market. That's important. It's important because of the millennials. And the millennials are out there, they're renting these wonderful downtown high-rise apartments. Yeah. Um, some people say that they are going to be permanent renters, they're never going to buy. I totally disagree with that. But they're delaying their purchases by about three to four years. Mm -hmm. Right now, the older millennials are in their mid-30s. They're ready, they're getting into their careers, they want to buy. Mm -hmm. The big problem is, can they afford to? Mm -hmm. Right now, when we see rents going, where rents have been the last several years, it's remarkably difficult to save up for that down payment you're paying an awful lot of money every month for rent. Right, right. Also, do they have the credit quality required? That has been a problem recently as well. They get more of a whiplash uh, scenario from post-housing bubble bursting. We went from anyone qualifying to it being remarkably difficult for anyone to qualify. Mm -hmm. um, that's a problem for them as well. But we talk about housing affordability, I think it's remarkably important. Um, we need to build more housing which fits into that demographic. Mm -hmm. and it is going to be smaller, it's going to be far less the big mansions that we've talked about, we've seen certainly over the course of the last few decades. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, they have less stuff, they need less space. And so, but are they going to find out there the, the kind of product that they're looking for? Are builders building to that uh, demographic? Mm -hmm. I don't think they are, and certainly not, not enough. Mm -hmm. Why not? Big function of it, said if we talk about townhome product, for example, yes. is zoning. And is only appropriate for that. If it's not, then I think it's down to our local governments to really try and address that question. Do you think they're doing that? Are they listening out there, the local governments, as I, I, far as changing? And I know, like in Bellevue here, we have the Spring District, and we have you know, some other um, areas that are popping up. But I'm, I'm still not seeing a, a lot of townhomes or these big projects when we've got this big 
when the Toll Brothers are rebuilding in Queen Anne, mm -hmm. where you live, mm -hmm. in the 50s, I think it's 57 right. units up there. Um, and it's happened in Seattle where they're, they're, you know, they've torn down a lot of these homes and, and built townhome styles, okay. but still not seeing a lot of it here on the east side. You see um, well, the government's really reacting positively to, to the changing demands of, uh, of our area. Well, we're not seeing a lot of it. And the problem is that you mentioned that the projects in Queen Anne, of which there are several, mm -hmm. uh, it's great they're building that kind of product. What's not great about it is look at where the price points are. Mm -hmm. We're looking at product coming online price between 800 and 1.3 million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, hardly, quote, affordable uh, any way you look at it. Right, yeah. But if you move out from those very close in markets to places like Columbia City, places like Georgetown, parts of Green Lake, again these ex-urban markets, which are still, they're still achieving good prices, but they're not the, the seven digits mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing very, very close. Yeah. Builders started building some town and product back before the recession happened. Mm -hmm. The trouble is they didn't think too much about it. A lot of product that got built, not necessarily the best type of, uh, of housing, shall we say. Yeah. What's being built right now is remarkable. I, I'm enjoying seeing it. There's a lot of thought going into it. Architects are really uh, getting a feel for what needs to be there. But it is going to be a problem with a limited amount of land. Home prices uh, are driven by land costs. And the value of land continues to, to grow very dramatically. Mm -hmm. you look at markets like Ballard, for example, where craftsmen's homes are being mm -hmm. bought and torn down. They're being torn down because the underlying value of the land is greater than the value of the house that's on it. Right. And it's being replaced. Again, it still doesn't really address uh, affordability. People then say, well, what about condominiums? Uh, surely it's right scale. And that's actually true. But again, from a price point standpoint, when you look at high-rise development, remarkably expensive. So that if you were to build today, you're going to be looking at uh, eight to $900 a square foot. Mm -hmm. Again, not necessarily affordable. Right. So I think, without a doubt, the city of Seattle is a great example of this. Sixty, over sixty-five percent of the city, in fact, almost seventy percent, the city is zoned single-family. Mm -hmm. And this is it's everywhere from Northgate down to essentially South Centre. Yeah. Is that accurate? Is that appropriate anymore? Or should we start looking to change that so you can get greater, denser product, hopefully uh, at a price point which we can interest first-time buyers. Without first-time buyers, we've got a big problem. Uh, if they're not buying new construction, they're buying to resell, they're the first on a chain of events which occur. Then you have your move-up buyers, move-up buyers again, move-down buyers. So yeah. without the first-time buyers, you kind of get stuck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things is uh, that, that you talked about in the past is how they're just not building condos. Mm -hmm. And a and large part of that is because of the lawsuits. Yes. Um, do you see that changing at all? Is there going to be a swing as these prices continue to go up? Yeah, I'd say not anytime soon. Uh, and here's why. A lot of people right now that are used to, uh, their knowledge bases revolves around building condominiums and not building them. What they are building are apartments. Mm -hmm. Why are they building apartments? Well, saying there's a big amount of built up demand. Mm -hmm. I think it's being satisfied right now. Uh, a lot of renters coming into the marketplace, coming into uh, their careers downtown, for example. They want to live close to where they work and they're paying an awful lot of money in rent. The reason why the developers are building apartments is you can build them, you can fill them up with, with warm bodies, and you can sell them remarkably quickly and easily. The institution investors are, have been out there almost rabid with demand to buy projects. Why are they buying these projects? Well, everyone's chasing yield, everyone is chasing a return. Mm -hmm. These pension funds have checks they need to write out every month, sure. and they're not going to put their money uh, into a treasury, for example, with essentially no return, whereas you can see quite solid returns buying apartments. So developers have noticed that. Mm -hmm. They can see the demand, you can borrow money to build an apartment project from a bank, mm -hmm. that's a positive. You can sell the project uh, to these institutions, that's a positive. Uh, and you will essentially make as much money building and selling an apartment project as you can could building and selling a condominium. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is you're not going to get sued. Right. And um, we talk about litigation, uh, that's really the, one of the biggest <coughs> components of it. Now, you talk about condominiums, yes, you can build them, yes, you will get sued. It's remarkably difficult to find financing mm -hmm. and to build a condominium, mm -hmm. certainly in high rise. And we talk about high rise, we're talking well north of $600 a foot to build it. Wow. So, you will, I think we'll see probably a couple of towers uh, go, start next year. Mm -hmm. It will look nothing like the, the, that that it did in the early 2000s. There's ostensibly a, a condominium tower on every other corner. Mm -hmm. we, are still, we will still see uh, continued 
aggressive development of apartments, though. Are we? Do you think we're overbuilding our apartments? Um, it depends on where. Um, so I think like Union, for example. example. <laughs> yeah. If we talk about it, say King County, no, we're not. Um, because essentially almost all the development patterns that are occurring, or development that is occurring, is in South Lake Union mm -hmm. or Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. So I think those two markets are becoming overbuilt. I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. And especially given the, the rental rate expectations, where we're getting close to $4 a foot in rent, that is not affordable. Right. That's 500 square feet for $2,000 a month. That's, um, that's amazing. That is remarkably expensive. So uh, we're bringing on several thousand units in 2017 uh, in Capital in South Lake Union. So I think without a doubt, uh, at some point in time, the music will stop. There'll be some people left without a chair to sit on. Mm -hmm. But that said, the advantage with apartments is when the market starts softening, you see rental rates start to drop. Mm -hmm. You see concessions come into play. Mm -hmm. Unlike a condominium where you have a, a baseline price that you have to achieve, that's not quite the case when we talk about apartments. So what we do is we see some softening, we'll see rental rates come down, that's going to be great for tenants mm -hmm. rather than uh, for owners. Will we start to see conversions happen from apartments to condos at that point? Or I'd say that's also unlikely. Uh, and the reason why it's unlikely, if you look at mm -hmm. existing apartment projects, and certainly, let's say, in the city of Seattle, mm -hmm. one of the biggest drawbacks uh, of conversion is the fact that the owner of the building cannot start affecting changes and renovations on that, on that apartment project mm -hmm. until the last tenant leaves. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, you have this debt, your, basically your mortgage uh, on your apartment project, mm -hmm. you serve notice to everyone to leave, people start leaving, some of them you have to pay relocation assistance for, mm -hmm. so your revenue, your rent continues to decrease, but your debt service stays the same. Mm -hmm. You still got to keep on paying, paying that debt. Yeah. Then the project becomes empty. Then you've, you've seen no income and still have that debt. Then you've got to do the renovations and repairs on all the units. Mm -hmm. That's going to cost you money with nothing coming in. Mm -hmm. Then you have to sell the project. That's going to cost you roughly 10% of the value of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you also have to offer a limited warranty as well to the incoming buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, on anything you've changed, anything you've improved. Uh, you need to offer a two-year warranty on that. Mm -hmm. So why would you do that? It seems to me as if it would be uh, a more of a hassle than anything else when the expectation is rental rates will continue to rise, people have financed their projects at remarkably low rates. Mm -hmm. um, it, we might see a couple of small 5, 10, 50, maybe 20 unit projects convert. Mm -hmm. but they will, will not see, or it's highly unlikely, we'll see towers converting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I'm here with Matthew Gardner, uh, Chief Economist with Windermere Real Estate, and we have several um, people on the line that are watching this right now, and welcome. Uh, if you like this page, please um, do that on Facebook and share it. Um, Matthew, I want to switch gears a little bit sure. and, and actually talk about China and, <laughs> and its effect on the Northwest real estate market. We've obviously seen a lot of money come in, and we are, um, we've seen this happen up in Vancouver where they put this 15% tax. Um, essentially on, on investors that are coming in and buying properties over there that have pushed a lot of them to come down here, which has been great for our pricing too. And, and you know, in addition to adding all these jobs and having low inventory, we've got Chinese buyers coming in. Is that going to continue? Or do you see that, uh, what the effect of that's going to be over the next, say, year or two or three? Well, if you kind of take a step back and say uh, Asian investment in real estate in the United States has been, for quite some time, several years, quite bullish. Yeah has not necessarily been the case in Washington state. Mm -hmm. About 4% mm -hmm. of transactions went to Asian buyers last year, mm -hmm. uh, statewide. Mm -hmm. Compare that to almost 20% in California. They tend to go to California, Florida, and the Northeast around Vermont. It's a very popular area, for, I don't know why, but mm -hmm. it is for Asian buyers. Now, so in general, we're not a huge market for them historically, even though certainly we do an awful lot of business mm -hmm. uh, with the Asian markets. They're here, and that's great. And certainly, uh, what the buyers we've seen in here, you have to look at why they're buying here. But essentially, they're doing what all of us are doing. We're trying to chase yield. We're trying to chase the return on our investment. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them actually buying houses, and an awful lot of them on the east side, and then putting their children into those homes whilst they go to university. Mm -hmm. What's very, very important for this demographic is the safety and security of their children. Uh, as it is for everybody, but they are very focused on it. And if the, the child's coming across from mainland China uh, into the US to go to, let's say, University of Washington, mm -hmm. 
they are being given, allowed to live in the houses their parents have bought, again, mainly on the east side. Mm -hmm. And they'll stay there through their time at the university. And then when they leave, when they graduate, that house gets sold. So what they're really doing is looking at the house as an investment. Mm -hmm. I've taken this money, two things, one of which is a place my child can live, that's great. Secondly, I have an expectation that house values will increase mm -hmm. at a very reasonable rate. Yeah. Therefore, when I come to sell it down the road, I'm going to be making money. Mm -hmm. So we combine those two things, that is what's been driving a, a lot of that demand. Yeah. Now, what has changed between August and now? And certainly Vancouver, with its goal of trying to address housing affordability unto itself, mm -hmm. has implemented this tax uh, on investment buyers, mm -hmm. on nation investors. So theoretically we think, well that's great, if they're not going to be buying there, they can come down and they can buy here. And have we seen that? Well, anecdotally, yes. Certainly, interest uh, and searches on various websites will demonstrate the fact that there's a lot greater, there's a fairly big bump uh, in inquiries into Washington State housing from potentially Asian buyers. Yeah. Will they all translate across two purchases? That's the unknown, and we're not too sure about that. Mm -hmm. We also have to understand that it's, a, it's important to look at exchange rates. The strength of the US currency is not necessarily a good thing, mm -hmm. depending on, on with what form your, your, your money is and you're looking to buy down here. Mm -hmm. It is more expensive, shall we say, than, uh, than Canada, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the value of US currency has strengthened dramatically over the course of the last several years, or a couple of years, versus the Canadian dollar. Mm -hmm. It is more expensive in that respect. Mm -hmm. Do I expect to see more buyers come down to our market? Yes, I do. But do I think it's going to be any form of, of panacea? Uh, it's going to be this wonderful thing, we're all going to be able to retire in three years based upon Asian buyers. That's very, very unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will only be a positive in that respect. The negative part is it adds in additional demand to a remarkably supply-constrained housing market. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, so thanks for that. And, and what, I guess one, I wanted to uh, ask a question from the real estate agent's perspective. So if you were to build a business plan for 2017, mm -hmm. which run your business like a business helps agents do that, yeah. You're the chief economist. You're going to build your your let's put your, your your real estate hat on. You're going to build your own business plan. Where do you where do you, where would you focus your time? First time buyers. Uh, I think that millennials and millennials from an age demographic, but also uh, first time buyers, just in general, they don't have to be of that age cohort, mm -hmm. are going to be one of the, I would say the big story for 2017. Mm -hmm. I think so many of them have been sat on the fence. I think they are now ready in their macro basis, countrywide, they're ready to buy, mm -hmm. and I think it's likely that over half of total transactions next year will actually be to first-time buyers. Interesting. Um, we need them. Uh, they are important. I think they're ready now. Mm. And so that we talk about it demographically, the older millennials are in their mid-30s now. They're starting to think about having uh, not just careers, but marriages and babies. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to do that sitting in a 500 square foot apartment in Belltown. Mm -hmm. They are going to become buyers. Now certainly increasing interest rates will have a negative impact on, on their ability to buy. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, it. that's going to be in place. Now, because of that, the market, and what are you doing to address the, their, their needs? Mm -hmm. um, they, they walk the beat of a very different drum than you and I. Yeah. And uh, therefore, I think it's important to understand the fact that there are demographics that's out there. They are going to be, I believe, they're one of the big stories uh, for 2017. But they are going to start getting into the marketplace. Uh, I think very big numbers. And so so that would be a... That would be a, a, a at least a thought to have when you're planning uh, your, your, your next year. So let's say I'm a, a, an agent that's working with a developer. Yeah. Um, you know, you just mentioned that they're, they're, they're different. You know, millennials' needs are just different. They're, they're looking for different things than maybe the traditional home that has mm -hmm. been built in the past out there. Um, maybe smaller square footage. Um, how, 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 do we, how do we address that, I guess, with, with, our, with these millennials? I mean, are, are we buying these these smaller homes and fixing them up, or are we building more townhomes? I, you know, it's, it's a I think we talk about what's being built. Um, we talk about the, the construction amount of developable land that we have. Mm -hmm. That argues we're going to see smaller houses anyway, just given the fact we're running out of land. Yeah. We could go back 10, 20 years and talk about the McMansions that we used to have. Mm -hmm. I think that is a business model that's fundamentally broken. I don't see that there will be speculative demand, I like demand for new construction mm -hmm. of those types of homes going forward at all. Mm -hmm. Any demand for those units will be met by the resale market, i.e. the homes that Steve Burns said and John Buchan 
and these kind of guys have built over the course of the last 20, 25 years, mm -hmm. that'll be enough. The millennials say they want, they don't, they have less stuff. Uh, they're less interested in having the four car garage and, and the seven bathrooms. Yeah. And so they, like to, they tend to look more experienced than they do belongings. So smaller product, absolutely, I think, is it. Now, what's interesting there is the fact that demand for that smaller, not necessarily just townhome, cottage-style product as well, mm -hmm. uh, in that 12 to 2,000 square foot range, mm -hmm. um, I think that you'll not only have demand from millennials, from the first-time buyers, but you are also likely to get additional demand from move-down buyers. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get hold of two very distinct demographics. Yeah. One of which is downsizing, the other one is getting on the ladder. Right. And so I think that is the kind of product which I would expect and I would like to see more of. And ultimately, we, we can't make any more land. Yeah. And so yeah. we only have a very finite amount. It is very unlikely we'll see our growth boundaries increase. Uh, it's kind of a sacred cow down in Olympia. Mm -hmm. So it's unlikely to happen certainly through the next several legislative sessions. Mm -hmm. However, we might hopefully get them to start thinking more about zoning and the appropriateness of zoning within the growth boundaries mm -hmm. to allow denser product. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately that is where we're, we're that, that going to go and go over the course of the next probably five years. Yeah, interesting. You know, what I want to do now is um, we've been on for about a half hour talking about some great questions. Really appreciate you having, having you here as well. What I'd like to do now is to open it up to some questions um, from our audience. So if you just type in some questions, that would be fantastic. And we'll sure. spend a few minutes doing that. Maybe Absolutely. 15 minutes. Sound sure. good? Absolutely. Okay. So um, let's see here. Do we have any questions coming in? Let's see. Okay. I do have a question on tiny homes. I'm tiny homes. <laughs> because too. that is a question, you know, they, they got cable TV on Netflix, right. the, the whole trend of, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the smaller square, mm -hmm. square footage, but um, with, these, with these millennial buyers, you know, is that going to be a trend that's going to continue? Well, I think on how you define tiny homes. Certainly, yeah. we've had situations of what's been defined as micro units. Yeah. And micro units are 250 to 350 square feet. Okay. Some of them have their own kitchens. Some, some actually don't. Mm -hmm. And that was something that uh, people thought it's a, it's a brand new idea. Actually, it's not. It's been around for the last couple of decades, but it's certainly getting more traction now. However, within certain cities, they've actually stopped it for the time being. Are we going to see a big push for that kind of product? Well, the problem is with that kind of product um, is that it tends to be developed in neighborhoods outside of the downtown cores. It also comes without parking. Mm -hmm. So what you do tend to find is within these neighborhoods, a lot of neighbors saying, well, this is great, but don't build it next door to me. Mm -hmm. Because we have a limited amount of surface parking. People living in these micro units have cars. They're going to suck up whatever parking they have left over. Yeah. So you've got to have what's called a, a NIMBY mentality. Uh, not in my backyard, so don't build it close to me, although we think we, are, we understand the demand for it. Okay. So in terms of micro units, that's the case. But in terms of, uh, of small, again, this 1,000 square foot to 1,200 square foot units, whether they be townhomes or small cottages, absolutely. Uh, is that going to be a trend that's going to continue? I really believe that it will uh, going forward. I think there's going to be very sufficient demand for it mm -hmm. uh, in these first ring ex-urban markets mm -hmm. around our job centers. Mm -hmm. I think we'll also see it potentially further out uh, into more classic neighborhoods and smaller cities as well. Beyond that, mm -hmm. as we start developing our mass transit infrastructure, you're going to see more of this type of development within a quarter mile uh, of, of light rail stations, for example. Mm -hmm. And we see light rail coming online, not yet, uh, I wish it was a lot sooner, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately they were going to wait until the middle part of the next decade before we really start seeing it. But as that comes online, mm -hmm. transit-oriented development. I'm not just saying development at the station, mm -hmm. but within a quarter mile of the station, mm -hmm. then you're going to see more dense zone. It could be that kind of product mm -hmm. coming that people will take advantage of their proximity to light rail. So expect to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. What about interest rates? Somebody had mentioned Mortgage that. rates. Yes. Mortgage rates have started, uh, obviously, as we all know, to go up. It had obviously the, the election had um, a big effect on, on the modeling that I've been doing beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, I had certain expectations of where mortgage rates were going to go next year. Mm -hmm. um, that changed uh, when we found out who was going to be the incoming president. What it's done is it's pushed uh, my forecast up a little bit. But again, it's relatively small. So I think we'll probably see 30 year fixed rates close the year 
at a macro level, not necessarily locally, but US rates on the average will probably be about 4.4 to 4.5% by the end of this year. 5% uh, is going to happen, but I think that's going to be a story for, for next year, mm -hmm. sorry, year after next, for 2018 rather than 2017. Mm -hmm. So have you seen an increase, a remarkably quick one? Yes, we have. It's a whiplash effect because of the fact that mortgage rates follow the yield uh, on 10-year treasuries. Now, the treasury yields jump dramatically because of one thing, essentially, and that is the expectation under the, under the new administration that we're going to start seeing inflation. Mm -hmm. One thing bonds hate, it's inflation. Yeah. And so, because that means that essentially if inflation is high and the yield on your bond is low, you're, you're really losing money. Right. So the yield on those bonds has to rise. As those yields rise, so do mortgage rates. Mm. So I think what I'd say is, whereas I was originally saying probably end the year at 4.3% on the 30-year fix, we're now probably talking about 4.5 to 4.6. Mm. Still, historically, remarkably cheap. If you think about the fact that 1990, um, mortgage rates were on average 10%. Mm. 1982, 20%. Yeah. So it is still cheap. So for us, it has a little effect. However, for the millennial buyers who have known nothing but three and five eighths mortgages, yeah. they're going to they're going to get a bit of whiplash. Yeah. From the fact that they might have to pay upwards of four and a half percent for a mortgage. Right. I think it will affect them more. In addition, as we see mortgage rates rise, mm -hmm. what is interesting is the fact that that means that we can buy less house. That in turn, as they go up, albeit modestly. That means we'll see a slowdown, or we should see a slowdown in price growth. Mm -hmm. It's a classic one in ten rule, yeah. uh, which essentially says for every one percent increase in interest rates, mm -hmm. our buying power decreases by about ten percent. Mm -hmm. So we can afford to buy less house. That I think will act as a bit of an anchor uh, to growth in pricing, mm -hmm. uh, really going across the country. Mm -hmm. Not a terrible one, but it will just be lead us to a bit of a slowdown. Not necessarily a bad thing. So are our rates going to go up? Yes, I think they're going to have insane rates. We're going to go up for the last three years, and I've been wrong. Yeah. Uh, but I, I promise you, they are going to go up. Um, but still, I think probably the end of the year, we're going to be around four or five on the 30 year fixed. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we have an, an agent who asks um, Do you expect new government policy to affect our job market? Um, a great question. Um, <sighs> Again, you have to turn around and believe some of the things that were said on the stump mm -hmm. through the course of the last eight or nine months. Mm -hmm. The biggest one of those that I heard relative to jobs is infrastructure spending and the goal of bringing manufacturing employment back. I think that's going to be a lot more difficult uh, than we tend to think it's going to be. Uh, manufacturing has been in decline really essentially since the early 1990s. Why automation? Uh, why pay somebody to do a job and a robot can do it? twice as fast and doesn't take six to six days. Yeah. So that, that kind of plus going away. And, and so I think to try and get those jobs to come back, that's going to be a tough one. Mm -hmm. However, we talk about infrastructure spending. So if you look at stocks uh, in construction firms, in uh, people like Caterpillar, for example, mm -hmm. that jump very quickly mm -hmm. uh, when we found out who is going to be president mm -hmm. because of the fact that the belief in is we'll see repairs to our bridges, repairs to our roadways across the country. Mm -hmm. That it could be a potentially a boon for jobs. Mm. And certainly the equity markets so far, Dow Jones again hit an all time peak again this morning, yeah. uh, seem to be believing it uh, yeah. and drinking the Kool Aid. So, do I think it will be a positive? Yeah, absolutely, I do. But I think ultimately what we do need to be cautious of is the fact that in a couple of years' time, we are more than likely going to have a recession. Mm. Now, we mentioned the word recession, everyone gets scared to death yeah. because we automatically revert back to remembering what the world was like in 2008. Right. This will not be a real estate driven recession at all. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're due. Recessions happen, used to happen, about every 10 years. Yeah. Now they happen about every eight years, give, give or take. Mm -hmm. So by the time this recession hits, which I believe will be late mm -hmm. 2018, early 2019, depending, mm -hmm. um, we'll have the second longest period of economic expansion mm -hmm. in modern history. Wow. We're due. That is going to occur in a couple of years' time, but between now and then, I would say there's probably more positives relative to jobs, and certainly the incoming administration is going to be inheriting uh, a, a business, a job environment, which is remarkably robust, mm -hmm. stable, unemployment, although there's still some slack in the labour market, mm -hmm. but the unemployment rate is continuing to trend down, 4.6% last month, mm -hmm. although the real number, I think, is closer to 96 mm -hmm. But that is still trending in the right direction. We're going to add on probably about 180,000 jobs a month mm -hmm. uh, in the country, mm -hmm. decent number. 
less than we saw the 200,000 plus we saw last year, or this year rather. Mm -hmm. But it's still, it's still great. Yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm happy about that. So I think the potential is, it could be a, a positive, but I would be just cautious relative to the belief that, uh, that manufacturing is going to come back in a robust way mm -hmm. uh, in this country. I just don't see how that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, another question from Terry, will zoning change in unincorporated King County? I'm sorry, I think. Will zoning zoning change in unincorporated? Um, I think we need to look, and a great question, Terry, thank you. Um, yeah. I, I think we need to look at it very closely, and every jurisdiction needs, needs to understand what its needs are. And this thing goes back into the argument relative to the Growth Management Act and our growth boundaries. Yeah. We know within, what we can build within these boundary lines. Mm -hmm. Outside of them, it changes and changes to one house per five acres up to one house per 20 acres. Yeah. Now the belief is, and certainly if you talk about King County, whereby every two years the county has to undertake a buildable lands analysis, mm -hmm. which basically says we have enough land out ahead of us to go through the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And they run that analysis and they say that's the, that we do. Yeah. I would argue fairly vocally that I think that uh, mm -hmm. we don't. I think the way that methodology is put together is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And if we looked at it in a real manner, uh, it would say to us, guess what, we don't have 20 years of land out ahead of us, we might have five. Mm -hmm. And so I think at some point we need to really absolutely consider zoning um, in order to increase that density. And that will come under uh, unincorporated King County as well. Yeah. It will be a battle, however. And I certainly expect to say spend some time in Olympia uh, with the legislature through the course of early spring and into the summer, mm -hmm. trying to get them to, to listen and understand mm -hmm. that these, this is an important thing. Yeah. And it is an important thing as we talk about <clears> the <throat> affordability question. Mm -hmm. And so will, will we see it? I will be hopeful. Do I expect to see it anytime soon? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. But at some point we really need to analyze where we are. And if we are to remain competitive, what do we need to do to do that? Yeah. A couple more questions and we'll just wrap it up sure. because we're right at about uh, our 15 minute. Any wild cards that you see could affect our market in 2017? Things that we don't see coming maybe or worries that... I think from a business perspective, um, again we look at the, the incoming administration that they, they've been fairly vocal um, specifically about one of our particular companies that is very important locally, that's Amazon.com mm -hmm. um, and the president-elect being, uh, shall we say, not a big fan. Mm -hmm. um, Amazon's remarkably important to our, our market. Mm -hmm. um, they hire an awful lot of people, an awful lot of our, our population work either directly or indirectly with that company. If something bad happened there, that obviously will have a very a fairly negative effect on Seattle. Mm -hmm. I think that's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the bigger picture, our economic relationships with Asia are important. Then again, the same thing comes into play. The arguments that the incoming administration talks about trade tariffs, trade barriers, mm -hmm. that could have a more focused effect uh, on our market because of our exposure to Asia mm -hmm. than many other parts of the country. So I'd say you have to look at domestic and international policy as potentially things that could hurt us. Mm -hmm. That said, what is interesting about Seattle from the 1970s onwards is that we continue to diversify. In the 1970s, we essentially went where Boeing went. Mm -hmm. And if they grew, we grew. If they collapsed or contracted, we contracted. Mm -hmm. um, but we continue to diversify, and that's, that's important. As we diversify, continue to diversify technology, software, biotechnology, aerospace, don't get me wrong, is, is still remarkably important. Mm -hmm. But with that diversification, uh, that helps us because it means we don't necessarily, we don't get beaten down too hard should one particular entity um, go away or, or start to contract. Mm -hmm. That's going to be good. Uh, so I think those are the things I would watch as potential negative impacts. Um, in the Seattle market okay. over the course of 2017. Okay. Um, interest rates going up, it's not, I'm not really not concerned about it. I think home price appreciation will continue. It's going to be a bit more modest mm -hmm. than we saw last year, mm -hmm. i.e. down in single digits and not double digits, mm -hmm. okay. uh, which is going to be important. Yeah. And no markets can really grow at 10, 12, 14% in perpetuity because we're not making that much more money every year to service that debt. And yeah. so I'd like to see markets go up. So I'm very comfortable in King County if we're going to be increasing in value by the four and a half, maybe five percent, depending on where you are. That's the number I would like to see. Mm -hmm. It will be above that in 2017, mm -hmm. but the trend is heading that direction. Mm -hmm. But we probably won't get there until 2018. Yeah. 
But the unknown said, I, I watch Asia, and essentially, um, I, the big question I have is with the incoming administration, there's, there's a lot of rhetoric. Rhetoric does not necessarily define policy. Mm -hmm. So let's see what they actually end up doing, right. rather than what uh, he ends up tweeting about. Yeah. Um, the two things aren't necessarily the same. Yeah. Um, but I would keep an eye on it. I watch really what the, the expectations are coming out of DC. Uh, as the biggest unknowns, I think in terms of housing, uh, we will certainly remain robust. We'll still see more people moving here from Oregon, mm -hmm. from California, mm -hmm. from Texas, who are by far our three biggest net migration markets to Seattle. Yeah. That's going to stay robust as well. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, uh, next year is one where I expect to see more more supply coming online, which could be good, but unfortunately, more demand will still exceed supply in 2017. Mm -hmm. It will not be a balanced market. We're slowly getting there, um, but it's still going to be Pretty, pretty hard, I think, for, for would-be buyers. Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, so it sounds like our market's real healthy. Yeah. It sounds like, um, you know, there's a lot of positives out there. And, and you know, I just wanted to end by saying how much I appreciate you being here, Randy right. Redmond, and um, coming to speak with us. This is obviously a new technology and, and something that I look forward to doing more of, maybe I'll be happy the, to. over the year or a couple of years. Sure, I'd so, love to. Thank you so much. And for everybody who's watching out there, again, uh, please like our, our, our Rib Lab uh, page here and share it with your friends if, you, if you've enjoyed this interview and look forward to others. Actually, next week we're going to be talking about healthcare. With the, we've got a healthcare wow. specialist consultant who's going to talk to us about um, health savings accounts mm -hmm. as a real estate agent, why you should be in those. And also uh, in the future, you know, we're going to have uh, some other uh, interesting guests out there. But I don't think anybody, uh, I mean, the economics is number one. Yeah. So thank you. again, thank you again. And, and Hi, welcome. It's been nice fun. to see you. Likewise. Okay.